Hello everybody and welcome to this new webinar of Privacy Rules. Today we are going to be discuss about data breach notification regulations that are among the uh, most debated issues all around the world and we will do that comparing them in uh, different countries uh, in order to see which are the most effective way to regulate uh, those uh, data breach uh, notification systems. In particular, we are going to discuss with our expert from Canada, Poland and Hong Kong. We have Christian Pennington and Lindsay Wasser from Macmillan in Canada and Agnieszka Wierczyska Kruzewska from WKB in Poland and finally Podrick Walsh from Hong Kong That's, uh, that give us an overview on how privacy rules can reach uh, firms from all around the world because we are representing every corner of the, of the world today and um, um, the, the discussion of today is going to be divided in two parts we will start speaking about the data breach notification requirements in general and then we will move into fines that is one of the scary parts of the uh, data privacy regulations so um, I thank all, all our members for joining us today and I would like to immediately start starting with Agnieszka and the European view of uh, of the situation. Um, Agnieszka, which are the key elements of the data breach notification requirements in Poland and in particular under GDPR and uh, who must be notified, uh, when and uh, what with content? Um, I think that I would like to start with saying that um, the notification of a data breach is something very new for, uh, for Poland, but I think that for most of the European uh, countries as well. Uh, the whole system has never been built on the concept of notifying um, like self-incriminating notification. Um, therefore, it's pretty new. And I think that most of the discussions we have with clients is they, why should they notify that they did something wrong? Uh, because normally that would be the thing that you keep away from the public. Um, so the concept under the GDPR um, that requires you to notify about the breach um, is, as I said, something very new. So it's something that we, on the daily basis, have to explain to the client. So the notification of the data breach has to be made within 72 hours from, from the data breach or from realizing that there was a data breach in the system. Um, I think that the um, and the good and the positive um, implementation of, of the regulation is that it's not all the data breaches has to be notified. Um, so not small um, breaches have to be notified uh, to the regulator. Um, it really depends whether the breach is likely um, to cause the risk with the freedoms uh, of natural persons. Um, so we always have to verify whether there, there is the risk on the side of the data subjects. So the first thing that uh, the controller has to do um, is to see, to be notified internally about the data breach and then do the analysis whether this is the kind of breach that has to be notified. If this is just a normal breach, that such a normal breach is subject to uh, the internal uh, reporting system, if the data breach is the kind of a breach that requires the notification to uh, the regulator, um, it has to be notified within 72 hours. And um, most of, I think that all of the European countries uh, introduced the system of electronic notifications. Um, so you fill in the form uh, in the electronic system, uh, which makes it easy, relatively easy, and fast to be done. So, 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 so from our experience, we did several uh, such notifications. Um, and of course, it's um, the most difficult part is to describe what was the breach, because in many cases, within 72 hours, you don't really know, and you're still investigating um, what kind of data breach, what caused the data breach, whether it was the malfunction of the system or it was the human um, fault. Um, and but the notification as such allows you um, to make the notification and supplement it at the later stage. So you are allowed to say that you're still investigating the nature of um, the breach um, in the system. Um, and, and 
the Polish regulator is very flexible and, and open um, to negotiate the way that breach is being notified. So following the notification, you usually get in contact with, uh, with the regulator um, and discuss the way such breach should be notified and should be described in more uh, details. Okay, perfect, Agnieszka. Thank you very much for this brief introduction. And I would like now to move to Canada. So to Lindsay, uh, I would like to ask um, if there are data breach notification requirements in Canada, which are them? And uh, are there changes uh, that uh, are in provision in, uh, in Canada or uh, anything else that may be interesting? Yeah, so the first thing that you need to understand about Canada is we actually don't have just one data protection statute. There's a number of different statutes across the country. So we have um, provincial legislation, we have specific legislation for the health sector, specific legislation for the public sector. So we've got a bit of a patchwork approach and not all of the statutes approach uh, breach notification the same. For the purposes of our session today, I think it makes sense to concentrate on the federal private sector legislation, which is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, or PIPITA. Uh, PIPITA was amended just in November of 2018 to require mandatory breach notification. So it is fairly new in Canada as well. And uh, similarly to Europe, there is a threshold for reporting a breach, uh, but not recording a breach. So in Canada, the threshold is that a breach has to be reported if it gives rise to a real risk of significant harm. And if that threshold is met, there's actually a threefold reporting obligation. Firstly, to the regulator, which would be the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada, or the OPC. Secondly, to the impacted individuals. And then uh, relatively uniquely, PIPITA also requires that an organization should notify any government institution or any other organization that can reduce or mitigate the risk of harm to individuals. So those are the three different uh, reporting obligations under the legislation if the threshold has been met. Um, in terms of the time period, we have more flexibility in Canada. So in Canada, we don't have a specific time period, but rather the notifications have to be provided as soon as feasible, which gives organizations in Canada some time to properly assess the breach. Um, but like in Europe, there is also the opportunity to provide updates if you uh, provide the notification to the regulator early on, but then want to supplement it with additional information. Um, when you're trying to determine whether the threshold has been met, the legislation provides some guidance uh, in terms of what types of harm could trigger the notification obligations. So it's not just financial harm. It can also be things like humiliation or bodily harm or property damage or, or damage to employment relationships or other relationships. And in assessing the real risk of significant harm, uh, an organization has to take into account both the sensitivity of the information and the probability of misuse. So a factual analysis as to what information was compromised and in what manner. Uh, the content of the notices vary slightly for the OPC versus individuals, um, but overall you do need to include information on the date or time period of the breach, the types of personal information that were impacted, um, steps taken to reduce or mitigate risk of harm, contact information for someone within the organization who can answer questions about the breach, and, and certain other specified data elements. Um, for individuals, the notice also has an overarching requirement to provide them with enough information so that they can assess um, the risk of harms themselves. So, so that's how it's played out in Canada. Again, fairly new reporting obligation and a bit more flexibility than we've seen in some of the other jurisdictions. Okay, and, and how effective do you think is this uh, regulation that you have there? So it has been effective in having more organizations report breaches. Uh, the OPC has released a report on the first year of breach reporting and found that the number of incidents that were reported um, jumped up by uh, six times the, the same uh, period before the mandatory breach reporting. So when it was voluntary, they did get some organizations that would voluntarily report a breach, but um, they, the, the number of incidents that were reported did skyrocket after mandatory breach reporting came into force. So in that respect, it has been effective in increasing the number of uh, breaches that are reported. I think we still have some work to do in helping organizations to understand 
when the real risk of significant harm threshold has been met. So that's an area where I think further guidance is going to be needed for organizations to effectively comply with their legal obligations. Thank you very much. And, and, and Podrick, let's move to the opposite side of the world. And uh, we know that in Hong Kong, uh, you are actually implementing a new data privacy um, regulation. Uh, is there anything related to uh, the topic of uh, data breach notifications? And are there changes and which is the actual uh, regulation there? And maybe to, to, I mean, one of the things that's interesting about Hong Kong is, is that uh, it does highlight the position of some jurisdictions in the world where a data breach notification isn't mandatory. Hong Kong is one of those uh, where data a data breach notification is recommended best practice by the Privacy Commissioner, but there isn't any statutory force behind that. And that's been perceived as being a gap in the rules and a gap in the, in the laws and regulations for some time. There have been some you know, serious data breaches in the recent past. In the investigation report, the Privacy Commissioner has included a section on the fact of, you know, reporting on the period of time between when the data breach occurred and when notification occurred, but noting that any perceived delay in that reporting timeline couldn't be commented upon because there isn't a statutory obligation to, to, to notify the regulator in respect of the data breach. Now, in Hong Kong, we're at the early stages of a legislative change in that in that there's been a, a report made to our legislative council proposing various changes to the and, and updates to the uh, privacy and personal data protection laws in Hong Kong. And one of those is to introduce a, a mandatory uh, data breach notification. And it's, it's quite, um, I wouldn't say speculative, but it's still quite open in terms of what the shape of that will look like. Um, but the, you, you can see some of the issues and some of the themes uh, are coming through that have already been commented on and expressed in, 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 uh, with the other speakers. As in, firstly, yes, there will be a mandatory breach notification to the regulator. Uh, yes, there will be a specific time frame within which that notification must be made. It, it won't be as strict as 72 hours, uh, but it won't be particularly lax either. Um, Yes, there will be a threshold, uh, as in there won't be an obligation to notify de minimis breaches, uh, but quite what that threshold will be is still to be debated and, and, and finalized upon. Um, and uh, also there will be a slightly different system in relation to um, notifying data subjects and those affected by the data breach. It's, it's interesting that in in Canada, it appears that there is a, an, an obligation to notify, albeit not within a strict timeline, um, to uh, the regulators and to the data subjects more or less around the same time, as, in, as soon as practicable and all those kinds of considerations. Where, whereas I think in Hong Kong, it's likely to pan out where there'll be a slightly different timeline, a strict timeline with maybe some rather... Um, minimal details, but at least the fact of the data breach and some basic facts about the data breach being notified to, to the regulator, and then a slightly different timeline um, to take account of, uh, you know, reporting to data subjects and uh, outlining what the plans might be in relation to addressing those issues. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Podrig. And let's discuss a bit about this, um, this topic. I would like to, to understand which is your view of each of you uh, on the uh, necessity of a data breach notification system. So is it a good idea and are there alternatives to it? Uh, I would like to restart with you, Podrig, and then move uh, in the opposite side with our speakers. In Hong Kong, I, I think you can see the difference because of the absence of it in, compared to jurisdictions where and mandatory uh, breach notifications uh, are in place. I think that the primary benefit is, regardless of whether or not there is a uh, culpability in terms of breach of data protection principles and other liability that might follow, what it does is it raises a flag. It puts it on the list of things that the regulator will monitor. Uh, and that, in f that has a feedback loop that creates better compliance. If you know a regulator is on your case, so to speak, uh, then you're much more likely to deal with the repercussions of the data breach in a way that does protect the interests of data subjects. So in principle, I think it's good because it feeds into 
a system that will enhance better compliance, and we'll speak about fining later, I think it also feeds into the ability of a regulator to regulate and to consider whether or not there has been a breach of regulation for which fines may be imposed. Okay, and, and what about uh, uh, Canada, Lindsay, uh, Kristen? Uh, what, what's your view on, on this question? It's not a straightforward analysis, I don't think. There's certainly pros and cons to it. Uh, on the one hand, it does provide an incentive to organizations to make sure that they implement appropriate protections for personal information because if they know they have to notify the regulator and individuals of a breach and they know that that can have financial and reputational implications, uh, it provides a very real incentive to ensure that that personal information is properly protected, which of course is, is positive. We have seen though in Canada um, a number of class action lawsuits involving situations where an organization you, perhaps made a mistake or was the victim of a crime. And in, in a number of cases where it's difficult to understand what damages an individual who might have been impacted would even have incurred. So it's, it's spiking some litigation that I'm not sure has um, you know, important public policy reasons behind it as opposed to just giving rise to um, you know, legal costs for organizations and defending claims. I think what will be important um, alongside having the mandatory breach reporting is to also have uh, an, a, an appropriate and reasonable analysis as to the responsibility of organizations who really are doing their best to try to protect information and have an unfortunate incident. We don't yet have any decided cases from our courts as to that uh, liability, but I think if both the regulator and the courts take a reasonable approach to their expectations of organizations, um, then I, I do think it's a positive thing, but we'll have to see uh, you know, where, where the standard is set and whether it's an achievable standard for organizations um, in practice. Okay, F thank you very much, Lindsay, for, for your consideration. And, and Agnieszka, uh, uh, I would like also to have your view in particular, considering that with the GDPR, you, you had big changes. And I would like if, uh, to know if this new regulation helped to achieve an higher level of compliance or if there is also in this case something that you would like to change. I think that generally the, the, the word compliance is a very fashionable word right now. Uh, and I think it really touches different areas of companies' uh, operations, including the data privacy. Um, so I think definitely the whole introduction of GDPR increased the awareness about compliance. So something that has to be done internally within the organization uh, before any breach of law um, comes into effect. So, so I think that from that point of view, definitely uh, we see the increased awareness of compliance, not only in big corporate international corporations, but also in smaller companies uh, where the likelihood of the data breach or any other breach of the law is as high as in a big corporation. So, so, so we see more and more small companies introducing um, compliance system uh, within their organizations. Um, before GDPR entered into force, the system, um, the system of data, uh, personal data protection was still in force uh, in Poland and, and, and the other European countries based on the data protection directive. Uh, but um, we all know that the system was not really effective due to the fact that there were no consequences for the companies for not really complying. So, so, so the, 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 the penalties under the Polish old regime, uh, they were really unsubstantial. Um, usually it was just correcting of the procedures internally. So the, the, the regulator would impose certain actions to be implemented within the company. There were very small fines that could be imposed, but not many companies really got fines. Um, and usually these fines were for not implementing the regulator's decision. Um, and, but I, I guess that the most severe penalty under the old regime was the criminal liability. Um, although it was um, in the law, um, the criminal liability of the management board of the company uh, or the person who actually caused the data breach. Uh, but I think that, I don't know, out of um, something like 400 investigations that I, I'm aware of, 
um, I think that not more than 20 actually finished with uh, uh, with an with, with indictment or probably not less than 10 finished with uh, um, some verdict that would impose fines uh, within the criminal procedure. So as I say, I mean, the system was not really effective in terms of getting the compliance in place. Um, the, 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 the introduction of the GDPR definitely changed it. So it's uh, so as I said at the beginning, it's uh, you see more and more compliance um, in place. Um, and I think that one of the reasons for this is just the threat of penalties and the obligation um, to notify. So, so I think that's as, 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 as all of you said before me, the it has implications internally. So companies are forced to monitor um, the incidents um, and they have to report them internally. So it's an increasing awareness of the possible incidents that could happen, which might, of course, uh, result in, in the more tightened uh, procedures for certain um, data processing. And also outside the external implications, it's that um, because the, the, the procedures are public, um, so we know um, who is fined, uh, we know what happened. There is also much more awareness of the possible incidents um, coming um, as examples from other companies. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. And let's move to the uh, second topic uh, uh, of the discussion that is, of course, related to the first one, that is the one uh, related to fines. Um, I would like to, to start back with uh, Kristen and Lindsay um, uh, on, uh, in order to know which is uh, the, the uh, you know, how fines are issued and who has the ability to fine in Canada and how it's working there. Great. So under PIPIDA, knowingly failing to report or record a breach is an offense that's punishable by fines of up to $10,000 Canadian or $100,000 Canadian, depending on whether the offense is prosecuted as a summary or an indictable offense. Now, importantly, these fines can't be levied by the Privacy Commissioner of Canada himself. The Privacy Commissioner can only make non-binding recommendations. And though these recommendations may have reputational impacts, if they're publicized, they will not in and of themselves carry a financial penalty. However, what the Privacy Commissioner can do is refer information relating to the possible commission of an offense to the Attorney General of Canada, who can then decide whether or not to proceed with a prosecution of that matter. Now, our privacy commissioner has been critical of this system for quite some time, and he's repeatedly sought increased powers, including the ability to issue binding orders or levy fines without the involvement of the attorney general. And last year, Canada's federal government released its 10 principle digital charter and an accompanying white paper outlining proposed changes to PIPIDA. And among those proposed changes was a suggestion we may see increased powers for the Privacy Commissioner going forward. However, those proposed changes still, for the time being, do contemplate the involvement of the Attorney General in levying fines. So it seems the Privacy Commissioner may enjoy some enhanced powers in the future. Finding powers may not go as far as he had hoped. In terms of how effective the current finding mechanism is under PIPIDA, there haven't been any fines that I'm aware of related to breach reporting levied to date. And as Lindsay signals, these are relatively new changes to the law, so those may still be forthcoming. So it's hard to gauge how strong of a deterrent effect the threat of a fine may be having on organizations. As Lindsay signaled, it has, the Privacy Commissioner has indicated that there's been a staggering increase in reports since the implementation of mandatory reporting. However, that increase could be attributable to a number of things, including simply an overall increase in the number of data breaches or the fact that there is now a legal obligation to report. However, we do suspect that the threat of fines has played at least some part in increasing the number of breach reports. And as I previously noted, the Privacy Commissioner, at least, is certainly of the view that there's room for the fining regime under PIPIDA to have more teeth. And in particular, he's pointed to the significant fines available under the GDPR and suggested that this has led to an increased effort by organizations to ensure compliance with the European legislation. 
Um, lastly, Canada's federal government has also recently tasked several of its ministers with establishing Canadians' right to, quote, appropriate compensation when their data is breached. So the details of this compensation scheme haven't yet been announced, so we're not yet sure whether this will be compensation in addition to the fines for failing to report a breach, nor are we sure whether this will be a statutory entitlement or recourse that individuals will have to seek through a civil action. So in short, stay tuned. It seems that the stakes for data breaches may be about to get even higher. Now, in addition to the privacy regulators, Canada's Competition Bureau has indicated that it will soon throw its hat into the ring when it comes to fines related to data breaches and to privacy compliance in general. The Competition Bureau has recently indicated that it intends to take action when organizations make false or misleading statements about the type of personal information they collect why they collect it, and how they will use, maintain, or erase that information. So if, for example, a data breach reveals that a company has implemented implemented safeguards that are inconsistent with those outlined in its privacy policy or other representations it has made to consumers about its privacy and data protection practices, this suggests that the Competition Bureau may soon step in to prosecute this as an unfair or a deceptive marketing practice. Now, importantly, the fines under Canada's competition regime are significant. As it currently stands, the Bureau can seek administrative penalties of up to $10 million Canadian for a first offense and up to $15 million Canadian for each subsequent order that is made against a corporation. So we'll be watching to see when and how the Competition Bureau exercises its fining powers in the privacy context and more particularly with respect to data breaches. And finally, to round out the the approach from Canada, as Lindsay signaled in recent years, Canada has seen a variety of actions and in particular class actions seeking damages in connection with data breaches. And the legal fees and reputational damages associated with these claims alone can obviously be very detrimental to an organization. Uh, Further, the settlements in these matters are not insignificant and have been as high as approximately $17.5 million Canadian as of mid last year. So in terms of the more suitable approach, uh, I'm not sure there's a clear cut answer, but in the Canadian context, companies are facing high profile data breaches, not necessarily in an either or scenario. Rather, the organizations are often subject to both a regulatory investigation and litigation at the same time. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And and Podrick, uh, to you, um, uh, considering what has just been said, there is a very different system um, from the one, for example, in uh, in Europe, which is the current fine framework in in Hong Kong, and uh, who can impose them, and uh, which are the alternatives also in uh, in Hong Kong? I, I guess you could call the enforcement system um, a little bit like coffee that's too weak to defend itself. Um, There is not really a a systematic way of using enforcement presently to uh, encourage compliance, which which should be what enforcement is about by making examples of bad behavior in a meaningful way that can actually have an impact on on businesses that are not behaving properly. by virtue of adequately enforcing in those circumstances, you encourage others to show good corporate governance, good uh, systems and good compliance and avoid those consequences. And, and that system presently in Hong Kong is, is, is frankly deficient. The, the, the privacy commissioner does not have any fining authority. Instead, uh, the most that he can do is to uh, refer particular matters to the Department of Justice. With, with With respect to the Department of Justice, there are probably other kinds of offenses that they would prefer to be prosecuting than privacy offenses. Um, Then in terms of what the Privacy Commissioner can do, he can uh, investigate, issue uh, reports, uh, make enforcement uh, directions, uh, and if those directions aren't complied with, then apply to court, and then you can get an order of court to compel people to comply with. But that is a very, very circuitous way of going about doing things. If you go the private enforcement route, perhaps unlike the case in in Canada, 
there isn't really either a culture or a, a system that supports, a legal system that supports class actions in Hong Kong, which means that you're left with individual data subjects who may bring private enforcement actions, in which case it really is a little bit almost like you could look at um, personal data breaches and the consequence, consequences of them having a corollary to something like maybe environmental issues where, you know, you use plastic or disposable plastic in order to have your, 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 your lunch whilst you're at work, you throw it away. What's the consequence of that? It's not the consequence of the individual. It's a consequence that occurs at the systemic mass level rather than an individual loss, which means that private enforcement in respect of a personal data breach if you follow that analogy, really means that it's very, very hard to show or to quantify an individual loss that supports a private enforcement claim. So really, there's a big, big gap in the enforcement system in Hong Kong. And that is one of the areas that is being focused on in the uh, proposals for legislative reform. So there is a proposal for the Pri Privacy Commissioner to have administrative finding power. And an example of the you know, the, the difference is there's a big, um, a very serious personal data breach in Hong Kong recently involving uh, an, an airline here. Uh, because the privacy commissioner did not have finding authority, there was no fine imposed. Instead, there were enforcement directions which have, you know, uh, are, have, have been complied with. Um, the same airline had issues in respect of, uh, in, in the UK, pre-GDPR. So this is pre-GDPR, and there's, already, there's been an announcement of an intention to fine in the UK for 500,000 pounds sterling. No fine in Hong Kong, 500,000 pounds sterling fine pre-GDPR in the UK, considered the most gravest of offenses or issues to, to address in respect of uh, personal data breaches there. So there's a gap in Hong Kong, um, but there is a proposal to bring forward administrative fining powers for the privacy commissioner in order to be able to uh, narrow that gap with international. Okay, that's very interesting, Podrig, and uh, you just you know shed some lights on the di big differences of, of of the situation in different countries. And uh, but of course there are uh, implementation of the regulation exactly for this reason, as uh, you rightly mentioned. So let's see how it's going to be. And and uh, Agnieszka, considering what your colleagues just said, which are uh, the main points that are interesting for you under the GDPR perspective, also in view you know of what can be changed or what can be better there. I think that the system, the GDPR system is young enough um, uh, to still give us a trial. So I'm sure that um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't like to criticize it because so far, I think it's, um, so far, I think it's working. And from the experience that just uh, were shared, um, I think that we were also in the system where um, anti-monopoly authority uh, took an active role in um, in punishing for um, for data personal data breaches uh, in the form of violating considering this as a violation of general consumer interest um, and I think that with having one regulator responsible for data breaches and this regulator being co coordinated on the European level we will have much more consistent approach. Um, to the data privacy um, regulations, compliance, uh, and consequences of breaches than it was in the pre-GDPR era. So, so I think that you know all the regulators around Europe are working hard. Um, the, the 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 European authorities are also um, putting together a lot of interesting guidelines explaining certain areas of. Uh, GDPR operation, and I think that you know the system is really building to be complete. Um, so there is awareness, but also there is an understanding, uh, which I think was at the beginning uh, um, a little bit vague because some of the provisions of the GDPR, as you know, are not detailed enough. Um, so, but with the explanations, with the regulator's decision. I, I really think that the system will be complete, uh, maybe with one exception, um, and the exception is that the technology is, you know, is escaping. I mean, the technology is much faster than the regulators. So my only my only worry is that you know we will not be able to keep up with the speed of uh, technological development 
which allows you to process personal data on a very high uh, speed and with huge amounts, uh, which the regulator cannot really regulate um, at this stage. Okay, thank you, Nieska and, and uh, Chris and Lindsay. Considering the, the possibility about having a private enforcement, do you think that this may be a more suitable solution, considering what Agnieszka just said and you know the evolution of technology that are rapidly expanding? I do think there is a recognition that, like Hong Kong, Canada's enforcement mechanisms could be improved. Um, like Hong Kong, the privacy regulator has to go to the attorney general, um, and they've, they've noted the delay involved in that and, and the, the lack of expertise um, that the OPC could bring to the table in terms of determining the appropriateness of fines. Um, there's many uh, different provisions of PIPEDA where there are no fines at all available. So breach reporting right now, if you fail to comply with that breach reporting or recording, fines are available. Um, but for simple non-compliance with most of the provisions of the Act, there, there's no fines available at all. And then we have the Competition Bureau, which, again, does not have the same expertise as the OPC in terms of privacy matters, having to, as Kristen put it, step into the ring because they do have the ability to issue fines. Um, the class actions are certainly a disincentive to organizations uh, failing to protect information. Um, but like in Hong Kong, there's problems with that system as well. And we've had some class actions certified and move forward and some that haven't been certified. Um, so there, you know, it does depend somewhat on um, the particular judge you may get or the particular facts. So we do have a very uh, patchwork um, framework and not, not an organized system for enforcement uh, the way that the GDPR has. But again, I sort of go back to my initial comments around, you know, having that more um, established framework, in my view, it needs to be paired with a reasonable approach to expectations for organizations. Uh, you know, standard of perfection is not reasonable, and, and I would like to see that if your the regulator does uh, obtain more powers in the, in the future, that they'll also apply a standard that's, that's achievable and reasonable organizations recognizing their responsibility to protect the personal information that they collect, but also recognizing that um, organizations are under a constant uh, attack and do have to deal with the challenges of having, uh, you know, employees who may act outside the scope of their authority or, or simply make mistakes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lindsay. We are running out of uh, our time, so I would like to briefly ask to each of you if you have any suggestion for companies or for the regulators in uh, the topic that we just addressed today, starting from you, Lindsay and Kristen, and then I will move with Podriga and Nieska. Absolutely. So I think for organizations, a tip that it probably surprises no one would be to ensure that you do have a breach response plan. It is not the right time to start thinking about handle a breach after you've already had a breach. And in particular, doing an assessment of what types of personal information your organization holds and the particular threats and risks to that organization's uh, data. Because if you consult with the business, you'll find that there may be uh, specific issues that reoccur over time or systemic issues where you can identify gaps and possibly remediate them, but at least have a plan for the most common types of situations that may arise within your organization. So having a plan that's specific to your organization and, and involves a sufficient amount of detail that individuals know how to handle the threats that may materialize is very important. And then, of course, testing that plan in advance so that you can identify any gaps that may exist. So that, so that would be the main tip that I would have for, for organizations. Um, and for the regulator, I would say that, you know, one of the most important things for organizations at this stage in uh, Canada's brief reporting regime, which is fairly early, is that I do believe organizations really do need some additional guidance on uh, when the real risk of significant harm threshold has been met under PIPEDA, because to date, other than what's in the statute itself, there is very little guidance. And I think this is the, the aspect of breach reporting that organizations are struggling with the most in Canada. And, uh, and Agnieszka, what, what, uh, what from your point of view, what are the suggestions for the regulators and companies there? <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's a difficult question. I think that um, 
um, for the companies, I think it's really, really important to have someone internally uh, who is knowledgeable, flexible, understands data privacy, and understands the operation and the business of the of the company. Um, putting together all those features, I mean, these internal employees can really verify whether there is a data breach, what kind of data breach, what action should be taken. And I think it's really important to have someone like this internally. And you mean just a person or probably a team? Because it's going to be a well, it depends on the size of the organization. But I think that at the end of the day, it's really one person who is taking the responsibility. Um, although this one person in a big organization might have a team of people, but then this one person really has to know um, what's happening in different areas of, 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 of companies' operation and where exactly this data processing is taking place. Okay, thank you. And, and Podrig, what, what from your view? Uh, well, I guess looking at both sides of that, um, here, here's the way I look at it. And here's, here's the thing. It doesn't matter whether you notify in 72 hours, in a week, or in a month. You've got to notify to a regulator if you've got a mandatory uh, data breach obligation. How you notify, what you put into that notification is going to dictate what's going to happen in a subsequent inquiry. You know there's going to be an investigation, uh, or there's a decent chance of an investigation once you notify. If you don't have the systems in place to give you the information to be able to give a fair and accurate notification, you are already shooting yourself in your foot. And that is what's going to impact you in terms of trying to mitigate finding exposure and other consequences of that data breach. So knowing that you've got the right systems in place is what's going to give you the best chance of being able to mitigate issues and address the issues that arise from a data breach. And so far as the regulators are concerned, I, I look at it as carrot and stick. I do think that you need the stick of strong enforcement but you also need to have a system that recognizes businesses that are trying to do their best. There's a difference between bad actors or actors who don't really care, who then, because of uh, incidents that happen, are brought to book for that. And they should go to, you know, they should go to hell on the highway. But the businesses that are trying to do the right thing, but make mistakes along the way, there should be some way in which the system recognizes the difference between that. And that's probably where I think GDPR in some respects, uh, went a bit wrong. So something that is a bit more moderate in terms of the standards that must be adhered to because they, they reflect business norms. But then if you don't adhere to those business norms, strong enforcement, strict enforcement, heavy fines and penalties. That's where I think a regulator should go. Perfect. Thank you very much, Podry. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen, uh, Lindsay and Agnieszka for joining us today. It's been really interesting and I hope it will raise many new questions from our audience. I thank you all for uh, listening to us today and I hope to see you again very, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all.